now. Okay, hello. Welcome to the Rocket Sync Community Sync number 11, is it? Yes. And yeah, we have some items in the agenda. So we can just start with Sergius, who's talking about Glide replacing Godet. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, one task on my plate for the next release was to introduce the vendoring, um, canonical Go vendoring, and replace the GoDeb stuff. And look at it as an opportunity to do a bigger overhaul and uh, just to throw away GoDeb at all. Um, so I'm fixing Travis right now. The build fails for Go15. I got this the Go15 vendor experiment variable. Um, so I have to fix that. Um, yeah, the, the, the PR description is pretty big. There's a couple of things that I found out. Uh, also a couple of bugs, uh, but not, not a couple. Um, one bug was uh, I found uh, on Glide, which the colleagues fixed like within 15 minutes, which was pretty nice. Um, and also we, unfortunately for Rocket, we cannot use the Glide tool only. Um, because our dependency tree is just just too big. If we use Glide alone without any tweaks, without any command line switches, we will have half a gigabyte of, of vendored stuff, which is apparently too big. Even if we use all the results from Glide, it will only go down to around 170 megabytes of vendored dependencies, which is still too big. And then we found this tool from Scotty, which strips down completely unneeded stuff like non-Go um, source code and other things. But actually, it does a little bit too much. So um, it strips down um, a little bit too much. And I have a pull request at the tool such that we can co actually configure uh, what things have to be stripped. Um, but um, if this PR goes through, um, I'm able to strip down the vendor directory to 11 megabytes um, compared to, I think, 17, me 17 megabytes by Godep, which is pretty nice. Um, and that's the current status. So it was a tough fight. Not, no, not all is sun, sun, uh, flowers and sunshine with Glide. Um, I, I, again, I found I found a small bug, and um, we lose one functionality, which is GoDeb Restore, uh, which actually is nothing fancy. It just simply takes all your vendor dependencies um, and puts them into your Go path. Glide does not have a equivalent functionality for that, um, so we have to decide whether we can live with that or not. There is an upstream issue for that. Uh, maybe we can implement it. Uh, uh, we will see. Um, yeah, so that's the current status. Is, um, do you have any, any more questions around that? I, I will be working on this in the next few days too. Hopefully it will make it into the release. So do you think it's easier to use than Godep for beginners? Or is it some difficulty? I think it is uh, more predictable because um, it is actually a simpler tool than Godep. From what I saw, it just um, essentially it does. It is a wrapper around version control systems. Um, that's merely all, the, all it does. So I, I have the feeling that it's easier to use. Um, also, I think it will help us in maintaining dependencies. Um, and what I mean by that is that Glide has the concept of um, of actually of two files which we maintain in the version control. Um, one is the descriptor of dependencies which expresses version ranges which we would like to have. And the other file which they call the glide.log is the actual pint version. So for instance, if we have a dependency on the IWS SDK and we specify we want to have everything bigger than version 1.3 and we call the update script, then glide will automatically for a, a fetch for us updated versions. Um, so I think it will make um, maintaining the dependencies a little easier in the future for us. Um, uh, what we have to do now is essentially we have to go through each and every dependency and decide whether we want to bump it or not. So this process 
um, will be automated by, by Glide a little more than by GoDebs. Whether it's easier to use for beginners, I don't know, I think so. Um, I, I, de I deleted a couple of sections from the hacking guide, so that's a good sign, I guess. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah, especially it will be good if we get, um, if we don't get at these situations where you don't know what GoDev is doing, and you just have to ditch everything and start over. So yeah, I'm looking forward to trying it. Yeah, uh, we will see. <laughs> every, every tool has its uh, own hidden gems. So I'm, I'm curious to see which gems we will find with Glide. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, another question, if uh, a dependency like, for example, Docker to ACI still use GoDeb, does it matter or do we need to switch everything at the same time? No, uh, Glide is aware of transitive dependencies which depend on GoDeb. So if the other dependency depends on GoDeb, it transitively walks through those dependencies and is able to resolve the conflicts. And one thing that I also found is that Glide gives us a pretty neat overview of uh, version conflicts, uh, which I even experienced in, in the context of Kubernetes. So for instance, if we depend on version A of a library, and a library B also depends on this li uh, library which we depend on, but on another version, uh, then Glide will tell us about this. And it will actually be a little bit uh, more fragile when it comes to those conflicts. So for instance, I had to resolve one of those conflicts. So um, I think in, in this regard, it will, it will help us a little more. Um, but again, um, I expect issues, especially for the size of a project like Rocket. I, I don't think that it will be like all flowers and sunshine. <laughs> And then what about other projects that use GoDeb at the moment that are vendoring parts of Rocket? Um, that's, a, that's, that's a good question. Um, I mean, we essentially will have the same issues as we have with vendoring, like with upstream etcd. So the project that pulls Rocket as a dependency will have to take care of stripping the vendor directory of Rocket. That's what Glide does for transitive dependencies that we pull in. But essentially you have the same problem with GoDebs. All right, thanks for the update. And yeah, looking forward to trying it. Um, next item is recognized status. So Ethan or Yuan, if you want to talk about it. And if you can. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I just want it. Oh. <laughs> Never mind, you go ahead, Yifan. No, I, I, I just want to join Alex. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't, yeah, I'm out of, I'm, I'm taking PTO this week, so I don't know if there are any updates. Oh. Sorry, I couldn't hear. I think that you're Sorry, probably. Uh, <laughs> I think you're probably in the loop still, you found because it hasn't been a, we've been making slow progress, but we also haven't run into any ground shattering things. We do have get logs from you guys. That's awesome. We have the Rocket 1.7 release, which is also awesome. And we're still just working on getting through the last remaining issues that we have with our test passing and our setup working for Kubelet and so on. Yeah. So anything else that the Rocket developers can help with? The only, like this isn't a Rocket developer thing. We were, I was running into, like, in my investigation into a test bug yesterday that for some reason when we, ex like we seem to exec Rocket into, like, into a container to run tests in the same way that Docker uses NS Center, but getting, for some reason, different responses, and I need to figure out what's going on there. Uh, there might be an issue there, but I don't know yet. Did you say running Rocket inside Rocket? No, 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 no. Execing into an existing container. So I guess you're saying a difference between Docker exec and Rocket enter? 
Or no, NS enter and rocket enter. Okay. The 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 doc like Docker and Kubernetes uses NS enter to exec like health checks inside the container while we rocket exec into the container. So we could also potentially just use NS enter, right? It's there. Yeah. yeah. Is that done directly from the kubelet, or is that? Yes, it's it's done directly from the kubelet. So this is keeping uh, uh, API and uh, levels of abstraction. If it's using uh, an center directly uh, without uh, Rocket, I'm correct on this. Right now, it's using Rocket Enter, and I I would prefer for it to stay that way because. Enter can be implementation specific, as I think you're about to point out. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah, I'm not arguing to use in a center. What I, all I'm saying is that for some reason, like we're seeing uh, it behaves differently, and I need to figure that out. Like in 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 our Slack Rock and Eddie's channel, I have lots of uh, comments in my late night. Uh, like discover, like exploration of this yesterday. Uh, I have to ensure that Pavel Skrzynski is also on this channel or it could be on this channel because we have also uh, investigation in this area. So this would be good if both sides uh, would be on the same page. Pavel, could you speak about this? Uh, um, I don't know uh, <coughs> what channel uh, Spotter is talking about. So this is mutual effort, or this is only done on the CoreOS side? Uh, it's on the CoreOS side, I guess. Uh, I can, I can, I can. Like, it's very much, like, my comments right now, they're very much stream of conscious. They're, they're basically, as I discover things, I'm just putting, especially because I was doing this at 2 a.m., it was to make sure I remember when I woke up. When I woke up. Well, you can CC him when you file a Kubernetes and or rocket issue, depending on what this actually is. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, what about issue I <coughs> bring on uh, Kubernetes that uh, I can create pod with Racket KeraOS? I saw that Ethan was debugging it, but uh, I don't know what is the status of this issue. 26540. <laughs> Yifan, did you did you catch that? Two six what? Two six five four zero. Oh, okay. Mm. Can you put the link on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I've seen that before when I don't specify the network plugin at all, and we should probably have it error out instead of crashing when you don't specify a network plugin. Um, I haven't looked into it more than that, but that's how I've been able to reproduce it. What do you mean by uh, not specified network plugin? Not having the flag on, I believe, the kubelet. My network configuration is start in RKT netd uh, conf, if I'm correct. So it should be uh, reset from there, or something changed. Mm -hmm. Something perhaps changed. Okay, so can we update documentation how to run uh, RKT test? Can you show uh, what's the uh, command line? What's the 
flag you pass to the Google, like the network plugin flag. I'm not passing the flag to Google. Wait a moment. I will try to find it on official documentation. Right, so we chase that one up offline in that issue. Okay, I think we can talk about this offline. The next thing that I volunteered we're going to talk about is uh, the master management, um, since this has been something that's come up over the last few releases as well. Yeah. So I was just asking today, John, if you are like putting too many things to, to be done just in the closest and next release and then bumping them forever. Uh, that was my feeling at least for the last few days. Um, I think I agree with the statistic. Yeah, so the, the question is then, I mean, I think I would like to keep the pretty regular release cadence now while we're you know, still settling on what it needs. So the question is just, what's the best way then to allocate issues and to balance that with, you know, community support requests coming in? Okay. <laughs> so we should uh, schedule some time to actually planning uh, get better. Do you mean uh, like a sprint planning for each milestone? Or? Yeah, because um, yeah, basically now what we do is we just push it to the next one, or if we see that it's complicated to the over yeah German uber next one. <laughs> um, so we should probably um, yeah plan more seriously. So maybe we can schedule some time and, and do that. Okay. You mean uh, like once every couple of weeks for the. Yeah, or after each release, um, after you know the the day of the release, maybe we don't get it done, but maybe the next day or two days later, like actually uh, consider the issues that we pushed to the next milestone, and 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 yeah, think about whether we should keep it there or keep them there or put it to another one. Yeah, something like that. What was that we are telling people and users and whatever that we're gonna fix everything in the next release? And then the day before the release, we just bump it to the, to the next one. Uh, I guess it's like for somebody external to the project looking at that can be like annoying or not nice. That was my main concern. I feel like cheating whenever I'm. I guess the user on the other side were expecting something and then the same day they don't have um, I cannot hear you so well. Uh, are you in front of the microphone? Uh, yeah, I'm just <laughs> over here. We're going to hear you very well, but John is running everything you say. So. <laughs> okay. so, no, I was just saying that my concern is mostly related to users that they see that we're going to fix everything in the next release and then we just say we were joking the same day. That was the, the problem. Yeah, it makes sense. So maybe a few days of uh, some freeze? Um, As in other projects? This is probably another point because actually the last release was a bit like uh, uh, bumpy and tricky. Well, because mostly because we were merging new stuff, new PRs on the same day. The same morning, actually, and that was the stuff that was breaking it for the whole weekend. So maybe, yeah, but that's probably another discussion. All right, so maybe whoever's doing the next release can take the lead on uh, doing the backlog grooming post the release. Um, Probably also do one for the next release, maybe tomorrow. Um, yeah, since I'm also sort of a newbie, um, a comment from my side. One thing that we briefly discussed was a 
thing that we would have called a moratorium. Like two days before the release, just essentially freeze any pull request that we want to put in, such that we have one day uh, offer to prepare all the change logs and to do all the bureaucracy, because to build the release process is still pretty manual and um, takes time. So uh, I just want to um, yeah, throw in the question um, this moment whether it makes sense to have some sort of moratorium before this, before the release next to the, um, next to a, or additionally to a, some sort of sprint planning. Maybe we, maybe we can merge the two together, like if the day before we say it's a moratorium for new code, we take it also to like assess what we're going to do in the next release and check if it is actually doable and feasible, if it is too much or not, and reassign stuff as needed. Yeah. Also because the day before you already know more or less like what's in and what's not going to be in, you know, how much stuff does it take to do the next one. Yeah. I think it okay. makes sense. That sounds good. Yeah, and then I have the next step, which is like I'm working on the second stuff. Uh, I know that uh, Alban was approaching Git from like the practical side. I was approaching Git on the other side because anyway, I need AppSea before to be updated in order to everything about it. Um, so I started drafting, drafting some stuff. The code is not yet super finished, super polished, whatever, but the draft is what I would like to have in AppSea. So if you could please have a look at it and see if it fits you, if it's like, if there is something that you think is missing too complex or not enough well specified, that's like, today is the day and tomorrow I plan like to finish it and submit the, the final PR. So, so far it's a work in progress and tomorrow is like. Definitely I will look on this. Thank you. Yes, me as well. I'm interested in reading it. Sure, me too. <laughs> Before going to, to sleep tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's, then we can sleep very well after that. <laughs> All right, so the final thing is the QME work and the rocket stop work. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, just a few words. Uh, we finally decided to uh, focus a bit, or mostly, on QMU instead of LKVM2. And as far as you know, I think that there was a pull request before that is closed right now uh, that Michał Stachowski done with QMU support. But it was just two branches which really much work, so uh, I decided to split it for the few pull requests. and. Uh, First pull request, uh, which is already uh, submitted, I, uh, I, I send it in IRC. Uh, it's covering only the first part of my plan, which is uh, only creating a generic function or interface uh, to provide another hypervisors. So it's the code which affects only our part, or LKVM part, let's, let's say like this, KVM part and uh, do not change anything. So uh, there's my request to review this. And uh, so I can uh, put uh, another pull request with QMU support. And then we can think about switch uh, default hypervisor from LKVM to QMU. And that's simply all with this. You got any questions about the work done for now? <coughs> okay. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I have a question about uh, switching the, the default and like why do you prefer or why is it better doing it? Why? Uh, there are some uh, problems with LKVM. We had also a talk with our friends from Intel from Clear Containers team and they found the similar issues uh, with LKVM tool, especially with a 9P file system. Uh, there are some issues uh, in our flavor in LKVM that are submitted to GitHub, but uh, to solve them, uh, we need to change in the code of KVM tool, which is a bit deferred and uh, 
the last pull request to KVM2, it's about a few months ago. So we had we have also uh, guys in Intel guys in Intel that optimize QMU for 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 this. So we will try. <clears throat> what a, a question from my side. Uh, yes. um, what kind of impact would that have? One nice thing that I recognized when I first saw the LKVM integration was the super nice boot time, literally milliseconds. Yes, yes, yes. So yes. We, are, we, are we going to lose that? No, no, no. Uh, okay. As I said, we got, uh, we got the people in Intel that work on optimizing QMU. It's not only the configure part, it's also the patches, but we don't know how it looks like in an open source political side for now. So, <laughs> so we will test it in our stack that we're building and, and, and we'll see. But QMU is not, uh, QMU is not so buggy as LKVM. So this is the main, uh, main thing. But LKVM support will also exist still, right? So would they initially would you be wanting them to they need to use a patched version of QMU or is it they use upstream QMU but they just won't get the uh, uh, we will uh, we will uh, we want to upstream of course the whole patches to QMU but we don't know how it will going to look uh, how it will going to look in, for, in, uh, in the future, right? Right now, uh, our patches are prepared to just download the QM from the main line and optimize it uh, in a configure uh, in a configure time, right? So configuring QMU without many drivers and, and, and features. Um, okay, so it builds the QMU and, and distributes, distributes it in the stage one, just like with the KVM tool? Yes, yes, simply the same. Okay. Um, John, was your question like why, why you moved to QMU? Like what's the motivation? Uh, the motivation is that uh, the LKVM tool has many bugs and problems, right? Uh, it's, as I said, we had a discuss. We had a discussion also with the guys in Intel from Pluto Containers team, and they swapped in their solution also from LKVM to QMO because of the same issues, right? Brandon, sorry, I didn't catch. Were you asking that question, or were you asking why we asked it? No. I like, is, I was asking you your question about what is the motivation for the change. Uh, no, mine was just about whether it needed to be patched or whether you know, people would be supplying a QMU, but better Got it. distributing it with the stage one. Uh, the racket with QMU will be looking uh, the same as the racket with LKVM. It's, uh, it's uh, creating interface which will allow to <coughs> use uh, one of them, uh, it doesn't matter if, if it will be a QMU or it will be uh, LKVM, it will be used as in stage one. I'll see. Got it. And what, what's the alternative to um, nine? So you mentioned that like 9P was a problem with the uh, LKVM stuff. So what is QMU using instead for, for volume? Don't ask me, I don't know for now. But but we uh, we uh, checked uh, some issues that LKVM has uh, with the QMU support and there was no problem with QMU. For example, there is an issue with sticky bit uh, for uh, for LKVM. We checked it for the QM when it looks good. So so simply here's the motivation, right? Uh, okay. <clears throat> so here was my review request <laughs> for the QM work, and a uh, few more questions about the racket stop. I uh, finally made the changes. It was today because I was waiting for review. You were waiting for my refactor, and uh, <laughs> here it was the another meeting. So uh, I refactored the function to kill just the processes 
the first step of tree, right? Um, to kill system D uh, and then system D and spawn, not the further processes. Uh, I use the uh, process package and it's already done and it's uh, on the GitHub and it's passing all the tests. So I also wait for your review. Sounds good. Definitely like to get that into the next release. Yeah, we'll have a look. Thank you. Alrighty, everyone, anyone else have anything that would like to discuss? Um, well, I can talk a bit about my progress today on Jenkins. Um, yeah, I submitted a pull request that repurposes the AWS script we had for tests into uh, AMI generation script that then can, we can put the, these AMIs on Jenkins. And yeah, it seems to work pretty well. So the provisioning takes a couple of seconds now and we can have faster tests. I had a, a problem with the rawhide image that seems to be kind of broken, but yeah, bleeding edge software. So I'll look into that, but yeah, looks pretty good. Uh, one open question was how to run um, the KVM oh, yeah. for, uh, stage one, Trevor, on Jenkins. We have not managed to do that yet. Yeah, so it seems we, in default AWS, you cannot run uh, virtualization. And yeah, I, I, did, I haven't looked into it very deeply, but I couldn't find anything yet. If anybody knows about that. Where does semaphore run? I don't know. That's a question, big question. <laughs> Can you break out of the sandbox and find out? <laughs> okay, I'll do that tomorrow. Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, just want to mention that. And from my side, I have nothing else. Um, well, I guess one other thing on the tests is, are we uh, close to having the GitHub integration working? Um. Um, I don't know. I try to configure the so to um, Jenkins already received notification from GitHub for everything crashed into master. But to get the pull request, it needs uh, an additional plugin, and I installed that plugin uh, today. Uh, but I can't manage to configure it properly, so it doesn't work yet. Um, I guess it's just a matter of uh, spending more time on it and finding why it doesn't work. Yeah. It, it needs a oh, it needs a different um, web hook for that, so uh, I think it will need to be configured. Uh, but you asked uh, the infra guys, right? Okay. And then there's a matter of fixing all the tests, <laughs> and yeah, we're working on it, and we still have some flaky tests that will need probably some rework. But I don't know. I'm running a build now, and it seems that both Debian passed, and yeah, everything seems to sort of pass after the SLE Linux fix. So yeah, I don't know what the timeline for having this working properly is, but shouldn't be too far. Yeah, cool. And what about uh, test fetch? I think there are uh, two issues uh, on GitHub that uh, test fetch it's, it takes too much time and it's, uh, it sometimes calls uh, <coughs> other tests to time out. Hmm. Yeah, so we increased the timeout to 45 minutes, so I don't think that's a problem anymore. But yeah, you're right, it's, it takes a long time. And the ideal solution would be to, to have sort of like a Docker registry that we can uh, yeah, start and do that instead of going to the Docker Hub. But nobody had time yet to, to work on it. So yeah, you're welcome. 
Derek, what are you doing for your testing of the um, stuff you're working on right now with the Docker stuff and OCI? Just unit testing? Um, <coughs> uh, what do you mean, like the stuff I'm doing for Brandon? Yeah, just in terms of testing, like pulling or pushing from repositories and stuff like that. Uh, I haven't done too much testing yet, currently more implementing. Just wondering if anything might come out of that around like spinning up a registry for testing a little more easily. Um, uh, yeah, right, right now I don't know if uh, that could happen. Yeah, it hasn't been a thought I've been focusing on yet. Yeah. All right, anything else? Not from our side. Nothing from me? No. Okay. So thanks, everybody. And see you at the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Yeah.